So again, welcome. Thanks for showing up. Uh, for this inaugural meeting, we're proud to present Dr. Shantanu Bakshi, who will today speak on biochar and zeolite for sustainable manure management. Dr. Bakshi is a research scientist at the Bioeconomy Institute here at Iowa State. His research interests are manure management, soil health, water quality, using biochar as a soil amendment. Now, this would include monitoring of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus transport in agroecosystems, moving from farmland to water bodies, and also assessing the effects of a biochar manure mixture on soil physical and chemical properties. His current work focuses on concentrating and recovering nutrients from swine manure for efficient recycling to cropland while reducing nutrient leakage and improving air quality within the swine production system. Shantanu graduated from the University of Florida at Gainesville with a PhD in soil, water, and environmental science. He earned his master's and bachelor's degrees from uh, one of the largest cities in the world, the University of Calcutta in India. Uh, he also spent some time in this department with Professor Laird, who's with us today. Welcome, David. And uh, you can talk more about that. So um, I will step aside. The floor is yours, Shantanu. Yeah, Go thank ahead. you, Dan. Good afternoon, everyone. So I am Shantanu Bakshi, uh, graduated in 2013 uh, from University of Florida, as Dan mentioned. After that, I came with uh, Dr. Laird. I spent here three and a half years, yes, so 2014, 2014 January, January 2017, 2017 August. August. After, After that, I moved for a short period to Connecticut with uh, Dr. Joe Pignatillo. Uh, I worked there for maybe eight months. And after that, I came back here again uh, at the Bioeconomy Institute with uh, Dr. Robert Brown. So since then, I'm working with him. And uh, currently, I'm the research scientist uh, position there. And I'm the lead scientist with the Biochar work, uh, working with him uh, in collaboration with also the AB, the Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering. So currently, we are having different uh, biochar projects, but, oh, I'm sorry, I have to stay here, right? <laughs> so uh, we, have, we, are, uh, we are having different biochar projects, but today I'm just going to give a, a short um, story, one of, one of our projects, uh, recently funded, actually not recently, uh, last year, uh, last year, February from the United States Department of Agriculture, National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So that is the part of, of that uh, grant. So my topic today uh, is Bachar and Zeolite for Sustainable Manure Management. So at first, uh, I want to emphasize that why are we considering swine manure? What is, why uh, this, what are the things that make swine manure so important? So Iowa is number one in the United States in the pork production. And uh, I have an old report from 2020. It's about 40.8 billion output from the pork industry. And based on that, we, uh, we have 33 million pigs raised. And it produces, one pig produces one point, approximately 1 1.3 gallon per day of manure based on the diet and the age. So now you can calculate how much many or we are producing every day. Uh, so 10 billion of gallons of swine manure annually. So um, swine manure can be utilized as a crop fertilizer. So, and it, it is not a new thing. That means farmers are using that maybe last seven, 10 years, the directly, direct application of swine manure in the field for direct fertilization of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. So manure from uh, swine fishing barn uh, in Iowa has average uh, nutrient value of 30 to $40 per thousand gallon of manure, considering 10 to 15 uh, pounds of phosphorus, 20 to 30 pounds of potassium, and 40 to 50 pounds of nitrogen per thousand gallon of manure. So manure has a more than 1 billion price in uh, price tag in nutrient value in Iowa. So we can see that here that it's very inexpensive. So four to eight cents per gallon cost, high NPK fertilizer value. And Iowa statewide analysis uh, indicates that 30 to 40 percent of the nitrogen and phosphorus per crop are supplied from manure. And 75 to 60 percent of the 
states available nitrogen and phosphorus are coming from from the swine manure. Can you go back and forth on your slides again? We're still seeing number one, but they can see the slides. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, I have talked about uh, soil manure can be utilized as a crop fertilizer. However, manure has several issues. So uh, it has a problem with the nitrogen, uh, sorry, the ammonia and volatilization and uh, tra manure transport problem. Also the nutrient loss into the water drainage, release odorous ammonia and H2S gases and very low uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. So liquid manure application cost around uh, cost around 1.6 cents per gallon plus two, around 2 cents per gallon per mile the manure is transported. So while this is this may not sound too much, but that means that manure nutrients never travel more than three to four miles radius from the farm they are excreted on. That means for the large farm, there is a huge problem with uh, nutrient concentration, uh, the surrounding area of the farm. So this has led to the concern to the farmers um, uh, of the over application of the soil manure uh, again and again every year. So they are applying manure. So it's led to uh, nutrient concentration increasing and also uh, keep farmers away from getting the full economic value of the soil manure. The United States uh, Environmental Protection Agency, they estimated that around 15% of the greenhouse gas um, are associated with the animal uh, manure management in the United States uh, agricultural sector. Okay, so now what's the problem? So the problem is the accumulation of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, in the water bodies and which causes severe environmental damage. So this accumulation of nitrogen and phosphorus often causes excessive algal growth, rapid increase in the phytoplankton, uh, depletion in the oxygen level, and finally, you know, eutrophication or the dead zone. So I can figure out, I can point out that figure in the Gulf of Mexico, that, that dead zone, the eutrophication uh, zone. And also you can see in this figure that the blue-green algae uh, that uh, on, on the water body. So the blooming of the blue-green algae is the best known consequences for the eutrophication and which uh, actually degrades the water quality, ecosystem dis disruption, and loss of recreational activity of the water bodies. So next is what is biochar? So uh, biochar is a recalcitrant carbonaceous solid product from the pyrolysis of lignocellulosic biomass. So you can see that here in the left side in figure, I, uh, that means there are different feedstocks, some energy crops, some uh, major commodity crops, woody biomass. We can use this uh, as a biomass, the biochar production. And then we can return the carbon from capturing the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and we can return the carbon into the soil. Besides than that, uh, it also produces bio, bio fuel, uh, bio oil and hydrogen, uh, which can be used for the transport, energy, co-products and industry. So I just want to give a little um, survey about the biochar current market value. Uh, so recent report it estimates that biochar market size or uh, will worth around 370 million USD by 2028 with the 12.1% uh, CAGR compound uh, compound annual growth rate and around 470 million US dollar uh, by 2030. So if we recall in 2019 or 2021, it was around what 150 and 170 million USD. So biochar market is increasing. And recent report, it says that progression of this market will continue until next eight to 10 years. So regional scope, so obviously North America, uh, Europe, uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Latin America, uh, uh, Middle East and also in, in Africa. Uh, biochar cost, so uh, biochar cost, it ranges between 200 to $1,000 per ton. However, uh, the technical analysis at the Iowa State University, 
So we have shown that uh, the cost may vary between 80 to 110 dollars per ton. So that is the current value of the badger uh, in this time. So next is why uh, is badger considered in this study? So what are the good points of the badger? So biomass, we have different kind of biomass, and we did the parallel, and we do the paralysis to produce the badger, and that is an uh, scanning electron microscopy image. So it's very porous and high surface area, high absorption capacity, and it can act as a sponge towards nutrients. So biochar has been evaluated in the literature for the last two decades uh, in, as a potential soil amendment. And it can increase uh, soil uh, cation exchange capacity, increase the water holding capacity, it can increase soil pH, and um, uh, it can decrease the, the nutrients leaching from the soil, as well as sequestrating uh, uh, carbon, carbon uh, and mitigating soil greenhouse gas emission. So that are, that are the good points about biochar. So biochar is diverse in nature. So different biomass produces different biochar. Also different production techniques produces different biochar. So heterogeneous composition related to precursor materials resulting in unique physical chemical properties. And it has variable porosity, which influences absorption and biological interactions. So uh, what I mentioned here earlier that biomass feedstock and pyrolysis operating conditions determine properties of the biochar. So that means biochar is produced under different production processes. Uh, therefore, it has the potential to be produced or to be utilized for a specific crop, soil, or substrate. So sources of biochar surface charge. So what are, what are the different surface charges the biochar uh, normally contains? So biochar surface is mostly uh, negative. Uh, it has a very few positive surface charge. So that means biochar has very low anion exchange capacity and poor absorber of oxyanions like nitrate and phosphate. So by electrostatic absorption, cation absorption, ion exchange, these are the, all the mechanisms can happen on the patches surface for the nutrients or the metals. However, uh, batcher can be modified for high phosphorus absorption. So partial oxidation condition of autothermal pyrolysis converts iron salt into iron oxyhydroxides, which is capable of complexing phosphate. So here I have uh, I've shown the basically the graphical abstract of this published paper. Uh, so what we did uh, const over and we pre-treated with iron sulfate and autothermal pyrolysis, which is also called the oxidative pyrolysis. And we produced some iron phases on the biochar. And after that, we did the phosphate absorption. And we have shown that this biochar is capable of absorbing more phosphorus and dissolving less phosphorus. So, and this is in the right-hand side, that's the published manuscript I think published in 2021. Uh, so David, uh, David, Dr. Laird is also here, uh, Robert Brown and me. So we published this paper in 2021. So modification of biochar surface with iron salts has been demonstrated in the literature as a promising absorbent for the phosphate. So, and in this study, we have shown that Badger can be used as an effective absorbent from the, acu from the aqueous solution, including livestock manure, um, the municipal wasted, agricultural effluents, and can be utilized as a slow release phosphorus fertilizer. In addition, iron treatment or iron, mo iron modification keeps the batcher surface pH in the acidic range, which is very necessary to reduce the ammonia volatilization. So, uh, yeah, the biochar can be modified for the uh, uh, for the high phosphate absorption. In the next slide, I'm showing that biochar can also be developed for slow release nitrogen fertilizer. So partial oxidation of uh, condition of the autothermal pyrolysis followed by phosphoric acid activation can sterilize urea onto biochar. So in this study, we have shown that a uh, woody biomass uh, biochar, pine biochar, we can mm, do some post pyrolysis treatment with phosphoric acid, and we can do some urea melting, and uh, we can develop some uh, phosphate phase mm, uh, on the biochar, and that biochar can be used to, for the urea 
uh, molten phase on the batch. And of, upon desorption, it is desorbing uh, the nitrogen to be available. So we can call it as a slow release nitrogen fertilizer in the right hand side. So that is the paper we published in 2021. Uh, enhancing biochar as scaffolding for slow release of nitrogen fertilizer. So that is the paper. And in this uh, study, we have shown that uh, biochar slow release nitrogen fertilizer can be produced with urea, paraffin wax, and uh, calcium nitrogen sulfonate as the binding agent. And the developed slow release fertilizers reduce ammonia volatilization and increased ammonium nitrogen uh, availability and reduced nitrate leaching from the soil. So now think about that added uh, the um, urea addition to the soil, urea fertilization. Uh, if you consider 10 to 70% of the added urea being lost, uh, you are adding in the soil, this slow release fertilizer um, has the potential to be economically viable. Additionally, the biochar, in this case, we are activating this biochar with phosphoric acid, so which adds some extra cost, but that phosphorus is, uh, will be plant available. So that extra cost will be offset by the reduced need of the uh, phosphorus fertilizer. So uh, just today, we have another uh, updates for this because we have done with this fertilizer, the greenhouse study for long-term greenhouse study. And we have shown that it, it is actually efficient for better nitrogen use efficiency. We just got today the, uh, the acceptance of that manuscript. So uh, that is our continuation work for this slow release nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, okay, so why slow release fertilizer? Why are we thinking about slow release? So we can think about the leaching loss, denitrification, volatilization. There are different ways nitrogen can be lost. So huge loss of nitrogen and phosphorus, and phosphorus can be lost as a surface runoff also, as added by chemical fertilizer. But biochar-based fertilizer holds strongly nitrogen and phosphorus. We have already shown that that we can produce nitrogen and phosphorus slowly from using biochar. In the next slide, I just want to give uh, an idea that biochar swine manure mixture has positive impacts on soil quality and plant nutrient availability. In this study, we have uh, we have done different uh, columns with biochar and swine manure mixtures, and we use the soil, uh, and we have. Uh, found, we found that it has a positive impact on different soil qualities and it, in, it is increasing plant nutrients uh, availability with the biochar and swine manure. So the treatments we investigated here in the soil only, swine manure amended soil, iron constover biochar and swine amended soil and constover biochar and swine amended soil. So uh, uh, we had four different kinds of treatments and uh, we published this paper in 2021, yep, in Frontiers of Environmental Science. Uh, also, engineered biochar can reduce order from swine manure. So uh, in this study, we have shown that uh, the superficial application of biochar onto the swine manure, uh, it can reduce the gaseous emissions, suppose like ammonium, um, hydrogen sulfide, Paracresol and skatol uh, to uh, 95%. So that means this is uh, bachelor application can reduce the order from the from the manual. So we published this paper in 2020 in atmosphere. So this one. Next is what is zeolite and why it is important. So uh, in the Wikipedia, it says that zeolites are microporous, crystalline, aluminosilicate minerals commonly used as a commercial absorbents and catalyst. So zeolite is being used uh, for the last, last one decade, I would say that as an acid catalyst in the thermochemical processing. Uh, and we can also uh, explore the zeolite use of zeolite in our study. So basically it has a, a zeolite contains both silica and aluminum ions, which is four plus and three plus. Now, Mineral weathering causes substitution of one silica ion with one aluminum ion. So, resulted in one extra negative charge. 
this negative charge can trap positive uh, charged positively charged ammonium nitrogen from the manure so you can um, engineer the surface of the zeolite with ammonium or you can engineer with h plus as um, to be used as an acid catalyst so so zeolite has a very high cation exchange capacity so that's why zeolite is very important here if you want to trap the ammonium how next how biochar and potassium saturated zeolite so please note that i mentioned potassium saturated zeolite so the zeolite i have used so i modified the surface with pot potassium so that potassium can be exchanged with the ammonium from the manure so uh, how biochar and potassium saturated zeolite can be used to build an integrated system that provides both economic and environmental benefits to swine and agricultural industry. So, so the answer is yes. Engineered biochar and zeolite combination can recycle swine manure nutrients and slow release them into the soil. So many liquid manure, and if we can use the biochar and zeolite to trap the ammonium and phosphate, we can make a solid fertilizer, which would be really helpful to apply in the field rather than liquid manure. So that is the basic concept for this study. In the next slide, I am showing the, the, the full sketch that what we are trying to do. So this is the integrated bioreactor system we are trying to develop that if we can use the zeolite and biochar and autothermal pyrolysis, which can also enhance the anaerobic digestion and we can produce a recycled nutrients which which we can apply in the field, which can reduce nutrient loss, can reduce synthetic fertilizer use, improved water quality and build soil quality. On the other hand, it can mitigate the climate change. And also we can produce uh, renewable fuels, energy and products. So this is the total integrated bioreactor system we are trying to develop. So the proposed project will examine the potential use of this integrated bioreactor system um, to reduce emission to the atmosphere and recycle nutrients from manure uh, for use in the crop production. So this system can provide an excellent opportunity to improve the economic and environmental performances of the integrated crop and animal agriculture. In the uh, next, uh, next few slides, I am going to show some results uh what we got from using biochar and zeolite from the manure this slide uh, i'm showing here that iron biochar adsorbed less phosphate from manure so adsorption equilibrium we have done with biochar and manure 24 hours the solid rate solid biochar addition rate is uh, five gram per liter in the left hand side i'm showing the iron biochar this model fitted with the lang mule on the right hand side and showing the control biochar, a model fitted with the Frederick isotherms. So please uh, note that iron biochar is following nicely following the, the Langmuir, but the control biochar is following just the Frederick. So Langmuir is a monolayer specific absorption uh, on the uh, iron hydroxide surface. So the phosphate is actually absorbing on that specific site. On the other hand, the control biochar is more complex, non specific physiosorption. So that's why it is uh, following the Frederick isotherm. So I'm giving, uh, I gave some numbers, 24 and 46 milligram per gram phosphates of iron batcher. But when we are considering control batcher, the 19 and 4 milligram, only 19 and 4 uh, milligram per gram of phosphate is up by the control batcher. However, iron batcher strongly bonds phosphate. So when we did the desorption, from the phosphate absorbed biochar using melic 3 solution for 24 hours. We notice that most of the phosphate from the iron biochar is there. We are not getting too much. So only you can see from the left side graph that 10 to 21% of the absorbed ortho B dissolved from the iron biochar. Whereas we, when, when we were doing the, the control biochar, from 35 to 80% of the absorbed ortho B dissolved from the control batcher. So iron batcher absorbed more and it dissolved less. So that means it can store the phosphate more than the control batcher. 
Now, uh, come uh, into the nitrogen, ammonium nitrogen. So iron batter uh, adsorbs slightly less ammonium nitrogen from manure. So adsorption equilibrium of batter with ammonium nitrogen solution for 24 hours. And we did the iron batter and control batter and um, the rate of adsorption uh, rates are quite similar for the iron batter and control batter in terms of ammonium. So around 39 and 49 for iron batter and 49 and 46 for control batter. And in both cases, the isotherm follows the Frederick isotherm. So it's a non-specific uh, physios option. Um, in the next slide, yeah. So we did, again, we did the desorption from the ammonium of batter with two molar potassium chloride, 24 hours and the same loading rate. And we found that batches strongly bound ammonium nitrogen. So deduction rate decreased as manual load increased and high manual loading facilitates ammonium co absorption with colloids. Mm -hmm. When the left side, uh, the iron batcher data and the right side, the control batcher data, and you can see that, um, uh, yeah. So the ammonium absorbed is the orange one and the ammonium dissolved is the yellow one. So in the control batcher, most of the ammonium it's still in the result uh, condition. So now the zeolite. Zeolite adsorbs less ammonium nitrogen from manure because zeolite has only the cation exchange positions to get the ammonium from the system. So we obviously get less ammonium nitrogen from the manure. So we have done the, the, the adsorption experiment in the same condition, 24 hours, and the solid loading is 5 gram per liter. So around 10 and 25 milligram per gram ammonium absorbed by the zeolite, but it less than the batcher. So batcher absorbed some ammonium and zeolite absorbed more than uh, some of this ammonium. So if we can sum up batcher and zeolite, so the total ammonium would be very high. So now, uh, this is the desorption, that when we did the desorption from the zeolite with two molar protection chloride, you notice that zeolite also strongly bonds ammonium nitrogen. So desorption rate decreased as manual load increased and high manual loading facilitates ammonium co-adsorption with colloids. So next is the breakthrough curve. So we did uh, a sequential addition of manure in, uh, onto the batter and then we did the breakthrough curve that where the CT by C0 becoming one in the iron batcher and in the control batcher. So we found that around 29.3 uh, milligram per gram uh, with the control batcher and 33.2 milligram per gram of the iron batcher uh, and the, of the phosphate can absorb onto the batcher. So however, the malic 3 desorption recovered around 47% and 85% of the absorbed phosphate from iron batcher and control batcher. So still iron batcher, you can see this iron batcher can absorb around more than 50% of the absorbed phosphate into the system. Whereas, whereas the control batcher is leasing most, most of the absorbed phosphate in the system. Next, Next is the XRD, X-ray diffraction analysis. So we did uh, the iron batcher, control batcher, iron batcher manure, control batcher manure. And we found uh, several minerals, so sylvite, struvite. Okay, let me explain. So uh, quartz, hematite, anorthite, these three minerals, magnetite, these three, four minerals we found in the batcher. So when we treated with the manure, we found a new mineral called struvite. And we also found sylvite and we also found the calcite. So that means uh, struvite is ammonium magnesium phosphate. So phosphate is preferentially got absorbed onto the magnesium phase rather than the iron phase. Uh, please be noted that this process, how we make the sample is, uh, we have a constant amount of batcher and we added the sequential addition of many. So in that case, we probably have washed out most of the iron from the system. So that's why the, the manure phosphate preferentially got adsorbed on the magnesium phase. In the next slide, uh, I'm showing another XRD that we did in a different way that we 
uh, we took the biochar and we did different manual load, low, medium, high. In that case, we found another mineral, which is called strangite, which is iron phosphate. So in that case, uh, we also found struvite here, but we found the strangite also. So we can infer from these observations that uh, strangite formation, since strangite formation needs uh, iron to uh, phosphorus molar ratio of one. So here, maybe we have supplied enough phosphorus to the iron from the strangite mineral. So there are two different scenarios, uh, how we can process the manure with the batcher. So if we, if we want to stabilize the phosphate onto the iron phase, maybe uh, we have to um, uh, do with that different manual load with the batcher. So overall, overall, our recent study shows that batcher and zeolite can recover phosphorus and nitrogen from swine manure. So in the left-hand side, I try to give the, the mechanism how it is working. The iron, the left, top left, you can see that different iron phases on the batcher. Middle one, the control batcher, and uh, the bottom, bottom one is the zeolite. So, so if you add these, the manure so has, has, has reduced UC, phosphate, phosphate and, and ammonia. ammonia. So after you add these things, so three different things can happen. So spent iron treated constable batcher where iron phosphate complex can form, where DOC can sorb electrostatically some ammonium, uh, where the batcher negative surface stretch can sorb uh, some ammonium electrostatic absorption. Uh, for the constable control batcher, uh, we form this struvite and also some ammonium coadsorption. In the spenzeolite, uh, we maybe we absorb some of the ammonium there, but still some potassium there. So these are the scenarios we have um, we have developed in from this study. The right hand side, this is the paper we published just uh, this year, January, uh, in Chemical Engineering Journal. So if you are interested, you can you can give a look in this paper. So it is a brand new paper. Uh, I think it's published in January or end of January, I guess. So Dr. Laird is also here in this paper. Okay. So yeah. So the next is uh, next part is the integrated batch zeolite system. So we are now trying to develop this nutrient recovery scheme in different chambers. And we will be adding uh, different biochars, different zeolite into different chambers, and we will be um, flowing the manure through the chambers and capturing nitrogen and phosphorus. And at the end, we will collect the water. And after that, we will we will collect the biochar and zeolite from the chambers, and we will do we will develop the nitrogen phosphorus enriched fertilizer. And we will do the field analysis, we will do the life cycle analysis, and we will do the techno-economic analysis, the whole system. On the other hand, we are also doing the anaerobic digestion and the greenhouse gases, where we are <clears throat> the, mixing the batter and zeolite uh, with manure. And at the end of the digestion process, we will be collecting the biogases, especially uh, the volatile fatty acids, uh, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and into, and we will analyze them, and we can optimize the source reduction. We can recycle the nutrients, uh, and we can do the energy recovery. So these are the two things uh, uh, in the in our future work. So we are we are already started working on these things. At last, I want to acknowledge uh, my team. So this is the grant we got last year from the NIFA. Uh, uh, Professor Robert Brown, so he's the PI uh, in that in the proposal. And I'm leading uh, the proposal right now with the USDA. So my other co-PI is the Chunki, uh, Chunki Banik. So she's doing the nitrogen management and the whole, whole project. Uh, Dan Anderson, so he's uh, he's the manure, uh, he's uh, Mr. Manure. So maybe you have uh, known him. So 
Uh, so he's doing all the menu collections and all the engineering things, developing the chambers, the bioreactor things. And we are planning to start the actual firm scale uh, demonstration uh, maybe within uh, within this fall. So we have a firm set up there. So we will do some automatic system and we will set up the chambers and we will do actual uh, field scale study of the menu there. And we will bring the spent biochar and zeolite here. We will be developing uh, the fertilizers here and then we will do the uh, field scale study. Uh, Mark Wright, so he's doing the, the economic analysis of the whole process, whole thing. And Peter O'Brien from USDA, maybe Dan, you know him. Uh, so Peter is actually, uh, he will help us with the, with the field scale study. Uh, so this is my team. And also I want to further acknowledge Ryan, our deputy director. And I have two postdocs. Uh, so they are working with me and they are conducting experiments and on this uh, bioreactor system. So for more information, yeah, so, so uh, you can you visit our website, biorenew.istate.edu. And uh, these are our emails. And I would like to end here and I will be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you for listening to me. I think we are on time. Yes, we are on time. Yeah. Well, thank you, Shantanu. It was a very efficient presentation. Very thank you. Powerful, clear slides. You got through a lot of material quickly. Um, yeah, we're getting near the end, but uh, I would encourage if those of you who have to leave at five o'clock, please go, go ahead and thank you for coming. Hope to see you again soon. Uh, for those who can stay on longer in person or online, I think, you, I think you'll stay here and take questions. Yeah, right? sure. Okay, so first, are there any questions in the room here? Just speak up or raise your hand. Anybody here has got a comment or question? Go ahead. Yes. So I was curious about the treatment of biochar with swine manure. Is that directly treated or is the swine manure altered at all before um, that biochar is treated with it? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Repeat, repeat the question. Okay, so you are asking that uh, the treatment of the biochar with swine manure, is it a direct application or it's, uh, uh, it's not direct or modification and that the treatment? That's right. So yeah, so what we are doing here, we are using engineered biochars and we are treating the manure in a different way, different, we are considering the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen supply, uh, not considering the volume of manure. So in some, you know that uh, the phosphorus and nitrogen content in the swine manure, it varies widely. So we have different firms who are uh, delivering the manure to us and the time to time, the manual concentration varies. So suppose I, we got a manual last week, which has a very low phosphorus, very high nitrogen. So last year, when we got the manual from the same farm, we have a very high phosphorus, very high nitrogen. So it's totally depend on the uh, swine age, swine diet, also, what time, uh, which time you are collecting the manure? So is it a fall? Is it a summer? Is it a spring? So it varies widely. So based on these facts, so we are considering the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus coming from the manure. Not like direct manual application to the biochar, but we are testing the manure at first. Okay, so it has X amount of P and Y amount of nitrogen. So we can customize how much manure we need to add it in, uh, in the batter. Mixing batter and manure, yes, it's a direct one. Suppose like if you are diluting the manure, so it would be diluting the manure first and then mixing with the batch. But in the chamber treatment, what I showed uh, previously, the diagram that we are developing the bioreactor, so that's that's a direct, direct application of, of the manure into the chamber of batter. So it goes in that way. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any more questions? In room, in room here, in the back? Is, is there, um, have you done any studies kind of on uh, engineering different sources of biochar? There's a difference, like to say like, okay, you have very woody kind of deciduous wood versus 
palm fronds or something like that and kind of the engineerability of, of those two. Okay, very good question. Mm -hmm. So I would like to answer this question. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. so he's asking that, have you tested uh, different engineered biochars from different sources, right? So would he say from herbaceous, from say from, uh, from other uh, biomass, right? Okay, so for phosphorus, so when we are treating the phosphorus solution into the biochar, it can form different phases onto the biochar. So suppose like for our iron biochar, it is forming the iron phosphate phase. Obviously, it will form some calcium phosphate phase or maybe some potassium phosphate phase, right? So different phosphate phases. So we are saying slow release because that iron phosphate will dissolve the, le the, the latter. The potassium phosphate has the higher solubility than calcium phosphate. Again, phos iron phosphate has the less solubility than potassium phosphate. So if we can make different phosphate phases onto the biochar, it would be beneficial. So now you need the calcium, potassium, all these metal ions in the biochar. So in that case, you have to choose a biomass which has a high amount of potassium, calcium, sodium, those metals those cations. So for phosphorus thing, uh, phosphorus absorption, we prefer to have a high ash biomass, suppose like corn stover or sweetgrass, which has a high sodium, uh, high potassium, high calcium. But for the nitrogen one, since we are doing the pretreatment uh, for the slow release fertilizer one, since we are doing the post-treatment and forming our separate nitrogen phase outside of the biochar, we prefer to have a low ash biomass, uh, say woody biomass, say pine or oak or even willow. So uh, long story short, so phosphorus one, we need a high ash biochar. For nitrogen one, we need a, a low ash biochar. But for the swine manure, so we are considering only uh, corn stover biochar, uh, iron treated, not iron treated. So it will absorb because ammonium is basically electrostatic, right? So it will not create a lot of crystalline phases onto the biochar. So we are considering just electrostatic adsorption. We are considering the constover, iron biochar, and zeolite. The rest of the ammonium can be absorbed onto the zeolite. So yeah, we have tested before uh, for the phosphate low ash biochar and the for nitrogen high ash biochar, but we found that the best way to go is is that it? Okay. Does it make sense? Yes. Um, Shatnu, uh, very nice presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, uh, I know you mentioned the economic uh, viability of the system, but you've got some input costs, uh, the production of the char, the iron sulfate that you're using, you've got at the same time, you've got the recovery and improved nutrient cycling, nutrient use efficiency. Yeah. Um, and I realize you're not completely done with the whole project, but can you give us a potential where you are today in terms of the economic viability of this system uh, for recycling nutrients? From manure. Is that right? So from manure, right? Right, from okay. manure. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Laird is asking that about the uh, economic analysis of, oh, I'm sorry, can what I go to that system? Okay, I just want to go. Uh, I'm sorry. So it's going too fast. Okay. So okay. So if we consider this slide, that wherever we are, uh, that uh, iron batcher, control, constrover batcher, zeolite, swine manure applications, and we are concentrating nutrients, recovering phosphorus and nitrogen. So we have done a rough economic analysis since we are not done the full technical economic analysis of the uh, process because we have to do that. Uh, bioreactor system develop and then we can do that like, full technical analysis. But in this paper, we have discussed a rough economic analysis. So if you consider the manual application, manual transportation, uh, direct manual application, obviously, versus our developed uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, absorbed bachelor and zeolite, 
we have shown that uh, around three to four dollars, uh, three to five dollars less uh, price for our system, considering that swine manure cannot travel more than three to five or five to seven miles. But our solid product, you are concentrating nutrients, you can take it anywhere if you want. So now consider our uh, uh, 100 gallons of uh, a barrel of uh, swine manure versus uh, a full truckload of solid biochar material. So you can travel with this solid material far away from here. So you have that uh, freedom that you can go anywhere. However, zeolite is what? 150 to $170 per ton uh, cost. So if you consider this, uh, then we got around 0.6, uh, 60 cents less effective than the system. But if you consider the transportation cost that you can go from uh, three miles to 10 miles, then again, our system shows that uh, three to four dollars more effective than application of the direct swine manual. So we have considered the biochar price of $120 per ton, zeolite price is $170 per ton. And we have considered the, 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 the miles it can travel. So we have done all these things and a rough economic analysis is saying that three to four dollars we can save if we go in that route, uh, if we can make the solid, solid fertilizer thing. But yeah, this is not the full economic uh, analysis. So we have to wait maybe more couple of years, how the firm system goes. And after that, how we can make the fertilizer after how the field study goes. So uh, we have to wait all these things to do the full technical economic analysis. Any comments, maybe? Uh, how dependent is that on the price of nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer? So obviously it depends on the voucher price, how the voucher price goes. So the recent report shows that it will go down. It will go down. Maybe we can expect some, some uh, somewhere around 60 to $70 per ton. So if it goes down, then maybe we can, uh, we can get more economic benefits from here. Also, it depends on the, from uh, the accessibility of the firm. Fortunately, in Iowa, we have, especially at the Iowa State University, we have uh, different firms here from where we can uh, easily go and then collect uh, the, the menu. So it depends on how far is the farm, uh, how is the bachelor uh, price, and also the zeolite price. So it depends on all these things. So I'm hoping in next few years, if the voucher price goes down, then the system will be more economically viable compared to if you consider the chemical fertilizer, suppose like um, uh, triple superphosphate or urea ammonium nitrate, chemical fertilizer, these prices are going up. So if you consider in that way, the chemical fertilizer prices are going up and then this thing, if it goes down the voucher price, then maybe it would be more economically while well, considering the chemical fertilization. I think Dr. Thompson had, had a question. Yes, yes, but I, I think we're running out of time. So if I, I can ask another time. Laura, are there any questions online? Nope, there are not. Okay. Any last burning questions? We have to, you really need an answer to? <laughs> I guess not. Okay, very good. Well, thank you again, Shanasa. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm.